for coming here today, Dr. Fatima Madabio, First Lady of Sierra Leone. Welcome to our studios at the United Nations. It's an honor and pleasure to be interviewing you today. Thank you very much for having me. So it's another year of the UN General Assembly. <laughs> You've come to uh, many of them. So um, how would you describe your experience this year? Well, um, at the beginning, you you know, when I first started coming here in 2018, it's basically introducing myself and um, wanted people to know the kind of work I want to embark on and then get as many support as possible because when it comes to gender issues, you need a lot of collaboration, not only within your country, but beyond your country. Now, five years later, I believe that I've uh, actually consolidated and I've got partners and I've got people who can listen to what I have been saying and um, the advocacy I've embarked on. And I think um, the validation has been a good one for me in the sense that I don't have to introduce myself anymore. <laughs> Your advocacy against uh, gender violence is notable. Um, can you share with us what drives your passion? For me, um, gender issues, I think it's well overdue. We should not be talking about, when you talk about gender, and then in the same sentence you talk about violence. When you talk about children, you talk about violence. Those two words, they don't match. They shouldn't be in the same sentence. So um, that has driven me and my passion and with my own experience of um, what, you know, the feeling of being violated, how it feels like, I think... That is the reason why I believe that I couldn't stay silent for any longer, that I need to speak up because there's a lot of lot of women, lot of young girls that are silenced, not because they want to, but because they don't believe that somebody else can hear their voices. Do you feel that there's been a shift regarding gender equality? I believe that... Um, we have more people listening now, and uh, we have more men understanding our plight. If I'm talking about the context of Sierra Leone, yes, our mentality has shifted from accepting to saying, no, we are not having this anymore. So in Sierra Leone, we are moving from acceptance to saying this is not right and we should not allow this to continue in our country. And I believe that a lot of women who have worked within the space now believe that this is doable. We can stop violence, we can stop abuse, we can stop whatever form of abuse against women and girls. It's doable. Mm -hmm. So now we now have that opportunity to say, yes, it can be done. Speaking of your country, Sierra Leone, what are some of the lessons learned that you could share with other countries? Um, how can women be protected in times of conflict? First, don't stay silent. Silence has never solved our problems. And to say, well, you know, because of my, I don't want people to know. Your dignity has been violated already. It's been taken away from you. So you knowing what has happened to you is enough for you to speak up. So silence has not worked in any way. And I believe that using your voice sometimes resonates with the other victim and then it resonates with another. And gradually, you are not alone in the fight. You have a lot of people standing with you and then you become stronger and believe that this is not my fight alone. So I think, you know, what I can say for all, everybody who are in this space working for gender equality, working for to stop violence against women, is that use your voice, scream as loud as you can, because somehow one day somebody will hear your voice. How do you handle the backlash? Because I'm not saying just maybe for you, but there are many women who have spoken up 
and they've received a lot of backlash. So how can someone handle, how can they continue advocating in the light of pushback? When you're fighting evil, you should be prepared to know that evil will come back to fight you. So for me, uh, my preparation is by ignoring whatever I said about me and not bother because the fight that I'm fighting is not my fight. It's a fight for as many people as possible. So why, I mean, issue that involves me, one individual should spoil something that could change the lives of as many people as possible. So if I'm going to be the sacrificial lamb to give hope to as many women as possible, then that's what I have to do. So ignore as many criticism as possible, ignore as many attacks as possible, because they're trying to deter you from actually, you know, unveiling their own secret. Because most of the people who attack you are part of that ring that believes that women should be silenced at any time. Women should not be given the opportunity to thrive. Women should not be part of the table when the decision is made. So those people who are so terrified of their own space, because it is not only about whether um, they want to silence you. They are fighting to protect their seats, and they know that if they you're able to uncover who they really are, they, that seat is going to be vacant for somebody else to sit there. So they are fighting for their own um, protection, and um, not protection as like they've been violated. No, they are the perpetrators. No perpetrators want someone to unveil them, so they're going to fight back. If you are in that space and you want to make a difference, you have to actually just ignore them. Because if you say they are fighting back and now you're going to be scared, you want to stop what you have started, then you have sacrificed the opportunity for many, many hopeful women and children who would have benefited from your campaign. Can you share with us more details about your efforts to champion zero tolerance against child sexual exploitation and abuse. Can you repeat the question again? Please? Can you uh, tell us more about your efforts okay. to champion yeah. zero tolerance against child what I, sexual exploitation and abuse? What I've done really in the last, um, I, I have been in this space, God knows, from my teenage years, years. but um, the platform that I had was not this big. It, it's not a platform that all, everybody would want to listen to me. But since becoming the first lady of Sierra Leone, I now have a platform that people had no choice but to listen to me. So I decided to introduce the Hands of Our Girls campaign. And what the Hands of Our Girls campaign is all about is how do we protect our girls from being raped? How do we protect our girls from early marriage? Because for me, because that is what I'm a victim of. Early marriage for me is a legalized form of rape. It's telling the men that it is it is okay to sleep with the teenage girls because they, that is not their consent. It is a consent of another individual. It is a consent of their parent saying, yes, I'm giving consent for you to come and sleep with my child. So for me, I still see early marriage as a form of um, legalizing rape. You know, and I believe that when we're talking about HIV AIDS, when we're talking about, about infant and child mortality, when we're talking about trafficking in persons, when we're talking about fistula, you have to address rape, you have to address early marriage, and you have to address trafficking in persons. If you want to reduce HIV AIDS, if you want to reduce infant and child mortality, if you want to reduce fistula, you have to deal with these causes first. You've been uh, making a strong uh, argument for uh, legalization regarding statutory rape in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. How um, far have you been able to come? Have you had any success? I think um, Sierra Leone now stands as a model in Africa. We have a president who believe that a woman should be given the opportunity to thrive. A woman should be given the space 
to actually be part of a nation building. So that is our biggest advantage. Through him, we have now had um, the sexual offenses court that sits only for rape issues. Through him, we've changed a lot of policies. Through him now, when you are found guilty of rape, your sentence minimum 15 years and maximum life imprisonment. It wasn't like that before. Before him, you know, a man can rape you today. Three months later, he, he'll be raping another child. Now, if you're found guilty, and that's why we have the special court, because the special court actually fast tracks um, the judiciary system. Again, that was also a problem before now. When you're raped, your case go to court. It stays there forever. But that's not the case now. We have a special court that sits only on rape issues. And when they sit on rape issues, if you're found guilty, you go to prison for 15 years. So that already is a deterrent. The men are scared. The Hands of Our Girl campaign is not a campaign that sits in the city. The Hands of Our Girls campaign has gone round, which means I have gone round the country minimum at least six times. There is no village in Sierra Leone that I have not tried to reach. If I have not been there in person, I have people who have been there. But one thing I can assure you, there is no district in Sierra Leone that I haven't been yet. I've been to all 16 districts and not once, but at least five, six times to talk about this. I have engaged religious leaders. Now, religious leaders are my biggest campaigners. So when they go to church, when they go to mosque, they talk about the need of staying away from young girls, why they should not marry off um, young girls, why men should not be raping our young girls. And I was able to get the coalition of the Paramanjis, who are the custodians of our native laws. So now they're the ones who are standing up and said, if you do this here, I'm taking you to the police. I was able, so I have a huge tax force that is working on the campaign from the police to the military to religious leaders to custodians of our traditional laws to the nurses to doctors everybody teachers principals i had a coalition because you know when you're trying to do something or you're trying to change a society mentality you cannot do it on your own so i was able to reach out to every sector that i know congregates people Hospitals congregate people. The schools congregate people. Religious houses congregate people. Traditional leaders congregate people. So wherever I know there's going to be a congregation, I make sure I have uh, an alliance with them. So they're all part of the tax force, and we are all doing this work together. So now it's become the people's campaign, not just my campaign. That sounds amazing. So... The feedback that you've gotten is very positive on the ground. I can say to you what we have achieved in the last five years. We have at least 69% retention in school for young girls, which has never happened before. We have girls now, you know, um, when we have public examinations, it's the girls who are at the top. That has not happened in a very long time. WHO came back uh, last year and said our mortali uh, infant and child mortality rate has dropped by 60%, not my statistics, WHO statistics. The education system, we now have nearly 800,000 young um, um, pe peoples in school, which means we have more girls in school, more girls that stays in school till the end of the year which was not the case before. So I don't do the data. I allow other people to do the data so that that validates my work. So the data that is out there has already spoken to the world that the Hands of Our Girls campaign is actually working. So um, the role of the First Lady, the role that you've played, clearly shows that you could make a lot of impact when you get behind policies like this to promote gender equality, to fight violence. Is this something that you're sharing with other First Ladies? This has been my campaign for the last five years. And uh, as I speak to you, uh, we have the African First Ladies Club called OFLED. And um, the last two years, we are mandated to focus on gender issues. So even if a First Lady wants to deal with any other issue, you can. But the gender issue is the... That is what we are. So it's called, for now, um, every first lady 
you know you could change the name you could uh, whatever it is but it has to be the prevention of our young girls how do we keep our young girls in school how do we protect our young girls from being raped how do we protect our young girls from early marriage how do we help them in empowerment how do we help them navigate this world that is so difficult today so i'm so happy our campaign is called we are together so you know um for all first ladies and which aligns so perfectly with the hands of our girls campaign i have been doing can your model can your blueprint be replicated in other countries in africa it's very easy it's the same thing protect your people protect women so we're just looking at the vulnerable people and said we are now fighting to protect this vulnerable side so it is very very easy you know it's not anything that is so complicated that it is not doable because it is doable there is nothing hard for first lady to come up and say my only interest is how do i protect young girls there are so many ways you can protect young girls there are so many ways you can protect women from the dangers of the world so many ways so it's replicable anyone can do it and it's doable if you were to share a message with uh, young girls not only in Sierra Leone but all over the world what would it be i'll say to them you know in life today you can want as many things as possible but you have to dare to dream you need to have a dream it doesn't matter what your circumstances are in the world if you have a dream you have a purpose and focus on your dream do not let anyone kill your dream for you because you live for that dream be focused be dedicated and make sure your part no matter how gloomy it is no matter how positive it is while you're on that journey look back and see the person who is behind you pull them with you because when you are on a journey with many people you last longer when you are on a journey on your own you burn faster Thank you.